Well, today we're continuing our series I called Identity Crisis. We're in between Revelation and starting with the New Testament again in Matthew, which we will start in a few weeks. But, um, but in between hand, I really felt the need to uh, do this series called Identity Crisis because after watching Enemies Within the Church, if you haven't seen it yet, you really should see it. We've been passing it around here. Um, we had a watch party at our house and people that have seen it are just shocked to see the direction that many mainline denominations and big church groups are going right now. And uh, there, it's, it's not the God and the Jesus and the Holy Spirit of the Bible. And so we want to make sure that we represent what the Bible says and not what we, what the modern Christian church says. And so with that said, we're going to go ahead and look at Jesus today. And so with that, let's, um, let's open our Bibles to Matthew 16 for our morning reading. And if you could please, if you can, stand as we read the word of God. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 23 in chapter 16 of the book of Matthew. It's a pretty popular story that many of us know, but it kind of sets the theme and the pattern for today. Um, So it says in verse 13, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Christ. And from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must Go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Lord Jesus, we ask today, as we look at who you are, Jesus, that we look at these same characteristics that we saw last week for God, and we will see, Lord, that the Jesus that many people are teaching and preaching today is not the same Jesus that's recorded in the scriptures. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be mindful of your way and your things and what you have to say about yourself. Lord, and know that you are a wonderful, beautiful Savior. Lord, that you are holy and righteous and just and that you willingly went to the cross to die in my place. And I am forever grateful and thankful for that. I don't ever want to get a different picture of you than that. And I am thankful and grateful for you. So Lord, be with us today as we look at these scriptures, we look at you, that we might be blessed to know you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And as we begin, so the question, of course, today is, who is Jesus? Um, It's not the same as who is God, as almost everyone believes in Jesus. You can almost go to any religion and any person on earth and you ask them, did Jesus exist or is Jesus a real person? And they will agree, as in God, not everybody will agree whether if God exists, but Which Jesus do they believe in? That's the question we need to ask. And we need to know that that not every Jesus that people say they believe in is the Jesus of the Bible. And it's pretty important because when you look around today, you'll see that Jesus 
has an identity crisis in the church. And so looking at a few verses here, and I'll let you get started on going to them, um, but Jesus warned us about what would happen in the last days, that there would be people that would be preaching a different Jesus. And so we would be well to heed those warnings. In Matthew chapter 24, as you see up there on the screen in verses 4 and 5, this is the Olivet Discourse. Jesus answered and said to them, talking to the disciples who asked what it would be like right before he comes again, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So there'll be many that will come in the name of Jesus saying that we know who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, but they will deceive many. They will have deception. And later on in this same discourse, but in Mark's account in chapter 13, verses 21 through 23, he further warns, Jesus does, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christ's and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. Jesus has warned us. He's given us the clear warning in Scripture. He says that there will be those that will say, here's Jesus. Here's the Jesus that we believe in. Be careful, because many false Christs and false prophets will be in the world. Of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is warning the Corinthian church because there were those that were coming into the church that were preaching a different Jesus and a different gospel. Most, most importantly, not only were the Gnostic heretics coming in, but it was the Judaizers that came in and were telling the Gentiles that they had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. And they were putting up with it. They were actually believing that 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 was the gospel that would save them. And Paul would say in chapter 11, verses 3 and 4 of 2 Corinthians, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, we'll talk about that next week, which we you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So we need to make sure that we are following the right Jesus. The Bible is clear in the days that we're living in, there will be many who follow false Christs. And not just the obvious ones like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. We know that they follow a false Jesus. But there will be others that, that will present to you a Jesus and a gospel that is not biblical. The Bible said that those things would happen. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude, they are both um, towards the end of the apostolic age, meaning in the you know, late 60s AD, wrote their letters to say that even by then, false teachers had infiltrated the church. And it wasn't that they were just outside the church with their false groups but they were inside the church and that was the problem because it says in second timothy chapter 2 the warning but there were also false prophets among the people speaking about the old testament they had false prophets that were among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will they will not openly, not with a, you know, with a name tag that I'm a false teacher showing up or, you know, a book that says Christian heresies on it. Pause to think about for a minute. Peter, even then, looking forward to our time now, shows that many will follow their destructive ways. Not a few, but many. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Most people that are selling you this garbage are doing it because they want to make money and make a name for themselves. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So the warning, we have a warning, a clear warning in scripture. 
But I want you to kind of, we're going to take a moment and look at a Jesus that the world is promoting right now on a million dollar ad campaign that if you're, watch, if you're still one of those people that still watch commercials and don't have recording and fast forward like we do, uh, you might seen one or two of these. And the thing is, is that if you've watched enemies within the church, you'll spot it out right away. It'll, it'll be like, you'll, the first two seconds of the video, you're going to know uh, what's going on here. But you need to watch the photos along with what they're saying with the words to tell the whole story. So take a minute. And this is a million dollar ad campaign by donors associated with the SBC. So give it a minute here. It'll start. There was this controversial figure. Everywhere he went, people challenged him. They questioned his ideology, trolled him. Called him ugly names, picture. but he never took the bait, never raised his voice, refused to retaliate because he believed he could change the world by turning the other cheek. Jesus had to control his outrage too. If you go to enemies within the church, you'll, for more information, they have a, a page on there called Wokipedia. And it's really good, great articles. Also a podcast called Conversations That Matter by John Harris. Great podcast that exposes a lot of stuff that's happening in the church today. But the fact that they say that Jesus controlled his outrage, do you know that did not happen? That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He, didn't, he did it out of love for you. He, didn't, he wasn't outraged. He didn't go to the cross and, and he, he wasn't like... Re, holding back his wrath he went to the cross willingly submitting to the father to take upon God's wrath upon himself so that you and I can be saved that is a woke Jesus that they're trying to say that people that are angry at the establishment and the government have you know that that's okay because Jesus was that way too that he gets this campaign is not at all what's going on here um, I need to open back my books here we go Okay, so here's a couple articles to kind of back all this up. Um, this is an article from the, um, it's a article from the Capstone Report. And this is a recent article. It says, Jesus was woke, question mark. The He Gets Us campaign sparks criticism among conservative Southern Baptists as the organization appears to be gay and trans affirming. Uh, also, top SBC pastors claim that He Gets Us campaign has poor or incorrect theology about Jesus' divine nature. We just saw an example of it. The He Gets Us campaign is in some sort of partnership with the North American Mission Board, a NAMB, and the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, if you remember all the stuff in Enemies Within the Church with Russell Moore and all those things, we saw all that in the movie. This is not sitting well with conservative Southern Baptists who declared the campaign woke and heretical. One leading SBC pastor said that he gets this campaign doesn't get Jesus, citing its heretical conception of our Lord and Savior. According to Georgia pastor Mike Stone, this is his quote, Today, the president of the North American Mission Board and the SBC pushed evangelistic cooperation with the He Gets Us campaign. A group that suggests the sinlessness of Jesus is debatable. Claims that Christ had moments of insufficiency or that Christ had worry and anxiety about the cross should, should his recipients of evangelism. Um, not evangelistic cooperation. If we had even one-tenth as much discernment as we have pragmatism. So he's just quoting saying that they're doing this because of pragmatism and not because of discernment. And basically, if you watch a lot of these videos, there are some that, that suggest that Jesus was, did have, uh, that he was fallible. And there, you can watch many of them. It says the SBC needed Mike Stone as president. That's a, Mike Stone was um, they, at their convention, but they didn't. Instead, the woke messengers, those who bothered to attend, or as reported exposed, were paid to attend the entity leadership like the North American Mission Board, which if you watched Enemies Within the Church, you would totally understand, but they voted for Ed Lidton. You might remember, and you remember in the movie, 
Ed Linton was exposed as a liar and fraud who routinely, routinely plagiarized sermons dating back to at least 2012 when Linton and his wife plagiarized a Tim Keller sermon on marriage. Remember, if you saw that, they were showing the two guys that were preaching the same message, which they got from somebody else. And so that happens a lot. But there is a conservative pastor, and I really, I'm not, I'm not, advocating this guy I know nothing about him but his name is Tom Buck and he has a Twitter account and he published screenshots showing that how he gets us promoted trans friendly churches now um, the the screenshots that he had of his conversations have been removed from Twitter and but basically uh, if you watch the episode about the he gets us campaign of conversations that matter on YouTube, you'll see uh, the actual screenshots of what happened. But according to Buck, uh, the SBC and this other guy wants us to join the He Gets Us movement. If you're against it, Easel says, you're not, you aren't evangelistic. So I went to the website and had a chat. So that's how it works. You go to the He Gets Us website after watching the commercial and it has a chat bot in there or somebody that, that you chat with online. And they're supposedly going to help you get plugged into a church. But unfortunately, through all the conversations I saw, never once did they share the gospel. They just want to direct you to a church. And it says, um, I went to the website and had a chat. How evangelistic are they? What would they say to someone looking for a church that will let them be gay? The He Gets Us movement that the SBC and this other guy thinks you should be excited about will also help you find a transgender-friendly church while never telling you is a sin. And I saw the conversations where the person was saying, hey, I'm gay in this one church I went to. And they said, well, we just want you, we can show you where a church is at. Never once telling them that their lifestyle is a sin and they need to repent and put their faith and trust in Christ. But are you still not convinced? This, uh, this Twitter post that Tom Buck shows, shows one of the videos at the end says, Jesus felt pressure to be a good example too. That, exactly. Anybody who's read the Gospels know that that's not biblical at all. Now, um, the SBC says in this one, he proves that they did say at the beginning of the campaign, and this is a 10-second video if you went to this Twitter post, that says that, that shows that they are in partnership with the SBC, but the SBC has come out after all the backlash and says they are not in partnership with this campaign. They have a history of lying, by the way. If you've watched Enemies Within the Church, which I highly suggest you'll do, you'll see the problems that they had with lying to some of the people that are interviewed in the movie. But read the pattern. It says SBC pattern. It says the SBC entity partners with doctrinally unsound organization. Concerned SBC pastors expose it, like we would, like we're exposing it today. SBC entity waits to see if it'll blow over. SBC entity gives a vague retraction. SBC entity leader praised for withdrawing. And then SBC pastors like us, or I'm not an SBC pastor, but we, those of us that expose it, we get trashed for exposing it and causing trouble. So that, you know, we have, we, we have a word for that in the Bible. It's called apostasy. And it's an important word and it is true. So we have to ask ourselves, we're going to go through our five points that we went through last time to find out who really Jesus is. And you have to remember our points. Um, we have to make sure that we, are, that we are not experiencing the same identity crisis as they are. We need to, make sh t we need to know who Jesus is and who Jesus is God. Remember the five points that we saw last week? Jesus is God. We're going to look at that. Jesus is holy. Jesus is righteous, Jesus is love, and Jesus is relatable. The same five points that we're going to look at in all our studies here in this identity crisis because those are the identity markers of Jesus himself. Of course, we know that, that um, Jesus is God. We know that. Okay, look, these are the scriptures that we're going to look at, so I'll give you time to go there. The first place is John chapter 8. We need to remember the context is that Jesus is confronting the Pharisees who do not believe that he is the Messiah. And their big hang-up is because of Jesus' deity. 
They knew exactly what Jesus was claiming to be. And Jesus told them himself. And the, f- the first important one is John 8. Go to John 8 and look at verse 24. Verse 24 is extremely important. It says, Therefore I, say to, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you're looking at the New King James, or I don't know what translation you use, but the he is in italics because it's not there in the original. The actual verse says, Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, I am the title for God, his deity, you will die in your sins. Not the created Jesus. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus did. So if you're not believing in the Jesus that puts Jesus where he is as the God, God the Son, then you're not saved. So I know we, we, look, we look at our Mormon pe- friends and say, well, you know, they're sure nice people. They sure do right. They stand for life. They march for life with us. But you know what? They don't believe that Jesus is I am. They believe he's a created being, that he's Lucifer's brother, and that makes them, that the, Jesus said himself that they will die in their sins. And so they need to get saved. They need to be evangelized. And so it's important that we know that Jesus is God. And then, of course, if you drop down to verse 58, 58 says, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he was declaring to the religious leaders that he was God, the son. In eternity past, there in human form, standing before him, that he was their Messiah, but they had completely rejected him. Most, there are those that will try to argue with you and say, Jesus never claimed to be God, which we just saw two places that he did. And so the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is God. And if you go to John chapter 10, verse 33, just go a couple pages over or maybe one page over in your Bible, you'll see that the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying. Because it says the Jews answered him, Jesus, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So that should end all argument, right? That's why they killed Jesus. That was their whole, that was the only thing that they had to send Jesus to the cross with. But if Jesus wasn't God, and then, then they had a right to crucify him. They had a right to kill him. And that means we would still be in our sins. Jesus was God and 100% man and 100% God. But we have to remember that that there are those even then that tried to make Jesus less than God. Because if you look at 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, John was dealing with this. Because he, of course, John is writing at a time to a church in Ephesus that was dealing with the Gnostic heresy that said that Jesus was not, he, he couldn't have come in the flesh as a man because flesh was sinful and he couldn't have been a man. And so they were saying that he, he was not 100% man. So it says, beloved, 1 John 4 verses 1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So they were told by John the Apostle to be careful of the false prophets that have gone out into the world that are preaching a different Jesus. And so we had to be careful. Which Jesus is it? Is it the Jesus that's God? Or is it a Jesus that was created? Remember, the second commandment that God had in the Ten Commandments was not to make a God in in an image. You weren't to make gods of anything, to make an image of God. And really, for us today, in our modern society, we don't carve idols, but we make images of God in our mind. We make the Jesus that fits us. Culture in the world today are making a Jesus that fits them. 
that fits their culture, that fits what they want to believe in. And that is a, that's why, G, that's why the, they were told in the Ten Commandments not to make any graven images or likenesses of God because that is your idea of what God looks like. And that's happening in the world today with Jesus. And so in 2 John verse, chapter 1, verses 7 through 11, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. Again, because they didn't believe in the humanity and deity of Christ. It's called the hypostatic union. Christ being 100% man, being 100% God and coming together. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose the things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, guess what? Does not have God. I didn't say it. The word of God says it. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So that when they come knocking at your door, nice and friendly, don't let them in your house. Don't let neighbors think, oh, they must be friends with those guys. You know, we're trying to be witnesses to people. We can't think that, you know, I know Christians that like to honk and wave at the, at the Mormons as they're riding their bikes down the street. Don't do that. Don't make them think they're okay in their sin and their false teaching. We aren't to share in their evil deeds. Anybody who claims to be one of those things doesn't need to be involved in anything that you're doing that's evangelistic or anything to do with the church, period. And so we need to be very careful. But now that we have that down, we know that Jesus is God. We know we need to watch out for those that would reject his deity. We know that he is God. We know that for a fact. But now that we have that down, we also must believe that Jesus is holy. Remember, as we said last week, that word holy means to be completely separate from all others. He is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He is exclusive. There is no other but Jesus. Jesus is the only one that could come. He is the only God man that could save. There is only one Jesus. There isn't a bunch of Jesuses. There isn't a Jesus of the Pentecostal church or a Jesus of the Baptist church or the Jesus of this church or that denomination or that movement. There's only one Jesus. He's holy. He's exclusive. There is no other. Because even the demons believe that. Remember in, look, look, go to Mark chapter 1. These will be the scriptures that we're going to. Mark chapter 1. I heard somebody say that, that at a, and I, I shook my head and I knew that he was wrong, but uh, I was at a, a, a group meeting and there was a pastor there and he was talking about how, you know, his son, one of his little kids came up to him and says, I hear voices at night, somebody calling my name. And he told him, he said, he said, well, that's okay. I'll just ask them if Jesus Christ is God. And if they say and what, he never said what to say. Well, what if he says yes? Because the demons believe that Jesus is God. They know who Jesus is. And they tremble, right? That's what the Bible says. So why would you want to... There was more to the warning that we'll see here and that we saw in John chapter in 1 John chapter 4 than just testing a demon. It has to do with the spirit of what you believe in inside your soul than it does the demons themselves. And he says that in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus, um, as, the disciple, as Jesus goes into the synagogue, it says, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we had to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demons knew that Jesus was holy. They knew he was God. They know exactly who he is, but they hate him. And they want to take you down. They don't want you to believe that. So they'll do everything to do to step in your way. If we, if we make Jesus less than exclusive, then we, we, we basically diminish who Jesus is and we're falling right into the hands of what the enemy wants you to do. Because he knows that a diminished Jesus, a non-exclusive Jesus, 
can't save you and you're on your way to where they're going and you get to join in the party with them. And that's what they want. It means he is exclusive. Of course, we know in John 14, 6, which we looked at last time, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is exclusive. No one gets to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Then Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. He is the same as God. He is just as holy. And of course, he is the only begotten Son. That means he is unique, exclusive, special. He's holy, completely separate from anything else. Because John 1.14 tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There is none like Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the only person to ever die, to rise again from the dead, and to never die again. He, that's why he, his ascension into heaven is so important for us, because it shows us that Jesus provided the way to heaven. When we put our faith and trust in him, and only him alone, our way for heaven has been prepared for us by Jesus, because he died for our sins. He paid the price for us. And that is why the next one is th number three, Jesus is righteous. Not like what we saw in the video. Not like what a lot of people want to make Jesus just like us, our, just our chum and our buddy. But no, he is holy. He's separate. He's not like us, but he's also because he's righteous. There is no sin in him at all. He was without sin completely. If you notice in... John 8, again, if you go back to John 8, they could not convict him of any sin. What did they do? They couldn't find anybody to agree when they went to their mock trial at night. The Pharisees couldn't find anything against him when they went and arrested him in the middle of the night, dragged him into a kangaroo court, tried to convict him. They, nobody could come up with two stories that were the same. And then they finally just asked him, are you the, who are you? You know, and he says, I'm the, the, the son of the living God. And they said, ripped their shirts and said, that's it. Because he said he was God. That was the only thing, but he wasn't lying. That was the truth. There was no sin in him. John chapter 8, verse 45 and 46, because Jesus is speaking, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? Nobody answered him and said, I do because he had no sin. And I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? See, Jesus was not only telling the truth, he is the truth. He is completely righteous. There is no sin in him. He didn't get, he did not have uh, a sinful thought in him. When we watch these videos that make him fallible, struggling the same way you and I do, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Yes, it does say that he was tempted in all points like we are so he can he understands what we go through when we're tempted but he was without sin he never gave in there was not one point in his life where he gave in to sin he was completely sinless because it says in first john chapter 2 verse 1 a verse we know very well my little children these things i write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is righteous. There is no sin in him. Anybody that tries to tell you about a Jesus that, that, that was not perfect, that was not completely righteous, is not a Jesus that can save you. He can't save you. For 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that, um, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That verse is extremely important for us because God made Jesus who knew no sin. He was completely holy, completely righteous, but he stepped in the place for us 
to become the perfect lamb, the spotless lamb of God to die for our sins. And because of that, because of our faith in him, his righteousness now is placed on us. We stand before God not based upon anything that we could do, not by any work that we could, no way could we ever earn it, but only because he has imparted his righteousness upon us. Now that God looks down from heaven, he looks down at any one of you that have put your faith and trust in Christ and he sees his son and he can say, you're righteous. I know if you're like me, you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and don't see righteousness, do you? I know I don't. I know I fail in many different ways. Every other day I can count them. I can sit there and start counting over the last hour ways that I've sinned either in thought, word, or deed. But I'm not, I don't stand before God on my own righteousness, but on his righteousness because he made it through life without sinning once. He was perfect. He's righteous. He's perfect in heaven. The only, the only imperfections that will be in heaven are the scars that Jesus will have in heaven because of what he did for us, to remind us of that through all eternity. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was not fallible as the woke he gets us campaign would have you think. He was righteous and holy, but he is also love. Jesus is love, and as we saw last week, it's not the love that the world is promoting. It's not the love of where we just accept everybody the way they are and give them a big Care Bear hug, and it is a love that is willing to sacrifice something for somebody else without asking anything in return, because these are the scriptures we're going to look at today, and the first one is John 13, and of course... (coughs) Excuse me, let me get a drink of water while you guys are turning into, it'll be John 13, John 17, and Galatians 2, 20. As we saw last time, God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. That God get, love, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love denotes an action and in John 13 verses 34 through 35 Jesus before he goes to the cross at the last supper tells the disciples a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another by this all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another This is very important because we need to understand that Jesus is love and that he showed that love by dying for us on the cross. Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves for others? That's the difference between what the world loves. The love the world has is always self-centered. I could tell you, I could tell you that from my own experience before I was a Christian. I had 37 years of trying to find love, but it was all self-centered. It's what I can get out of this relationship. It's what makes me happy. But biblical love is what I can do for somebody else without asking for something in return. How can I bless that person with my life and serve them? And that's the idea here. Jesus is our example by showing us what love is, by dying for us, that we might have life. Remember in John 17, when he's praying to the Father, the actual Lord's Prayer, in verse 24, at the end he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So this love that Jesus is, he imparts to us. And he's given us love by showing us what real love is. You can't know what really lo- real love is until you realize what Jesus did for you on the cross. That the price that he was willing to pay so that you would have life. 
People don't get that today. You know, they don't, they, they, we want, they, people want a church that accepts them in their sin and not accept them to be forgiven of their sin. To see the power of Christ come upon a person to no longer be in that sin. That's what I want to see. And are we willing to sacrifice ourselves to see other people come to the place? What are we willing to give up so that somebody can know that God can forgive them of their sin? You know, we don't want to offend people today. We don't want to take people to the courtroom because they might get offended. You know, who are you judging me, man? Calling me a sinner, man. But it's not us that does that. It's God's word. If Jesus saves you from your sin, you need to know what that sin is in order to be saved from it. That's real love. And the church today isn't willing to sacrifice their name or their good standing in the community by accepting sin instead of pointing it out. Because Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses, this was actually um, one of my life verses when I first got saved, when it says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is true love. That in the midst of my sin, while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't wait until I cleaned my life up, thank goodness, because I shared my story a little bit before, that I was ready to give up. I had tried to clean myself up, and I was at the point where I was just going to go out and basically commit slow suicide, diving deep into my drug addiction, but Christ stopped me. And showed me he just wanted me to trust him. That he went ahead of me and showed me how much he loved me by dying in my place. And breaking the power of sin in my life. Love is action. And love is who he is. But do you know that Jesus is also relatable? Oh, come on. There we go. Jesus is relatable. He is relatable. Just like God is relatable. And we'll see next week that the Holy Spirit is relatable. We're going to look at three sections of scripture. Now, this is not exhaustive, you guys. You can take these five points that I put and go into the Bible, do word searches and look for yourself, and it's full. All these things that I'm saying to you are, are all through scripture about God the Son, God, him, God the Father, and God the Spirit, as we will see next week. But he, Jesus, is relatable because he said it himself in John, Matthew chapter 11. He's told the disciples, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and will, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think that's a word that we can hear over and over again in our life as we try to frustratedly live in this world that we live in today. You know, the world's full of anxiety and unrest and worry. But we can find rest in Christ, in our relationship that he has with us. He wants to walk with us through, through our troubles in life, and he will, and he does, because he is relatable. In John chapter 6, we read in verse 37 and 38, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will, no, will by no means cast out. Isn't that good news? That Jesus, if you come to Jesus humbly with an open heart, he's not going to cast you out. He's not going to throw you to the curb. He's not going to tell you, oh, well, you, you did A, B, and C today. Nope. He will no, by no means cast you out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And as we saw last week, that it's God's desire that you would turn your, and put your faith in his son. He will not cast you out. If you're struggling in sin today and you want to find a place of rest, go to Jesus. He is relatable. It's not a religion. It's not a ritual that you do. It is putting your faith and trust in him and then walking with him for the rest of your life and really all of eternity. 
And of course, the most famous verse is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The importance of this verse doesn't really make sense until you understand the, the Middle Eastern culture and what it means to sit down and eat with somebody. If you've never been to a biblical dinner, I'm going to try to get Jay down here next year sometime to do a biblical dinner for both churches. Um, I, he's, been, he's been chomping at the bit to get me to bring him down here, and uh, we'll do that. And if you've never been to one, you will enjoy it because you'll understand how intimate a meal with somebody is. This is the closest thing that you can, this is the closest relationship you can have with somebody when you have a Middle Eastern meal. It's, the, the, it's secondary to the relationship you have with your wife. That's how intimate they see when you have a dinner with somebody. And Jesus is saying that if you open the door, if you hear his voice, he will come in and he will not just, you know, it's not that he just, forgets and forgives your sins he provided a way that your sins have been paid for that he can now come in and have a relationship with you he can and he can sit down and dine with you which is to them in that culture was so important that means you were becoming one with that person you were you had a bondship a bonding that was as close as blood family when you would sit down and have a meal with somebody. So, and notice that he says, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So we have a meal with him. We are having a relationship with him as he is having a relationship with us. That's the word today. And so as we finish up today, I want to ask, is he knocking at the door of your heart today? But you have to let him in. You have to let him in. Not the woke Jesus who is foul, a fallible human being like you. Not the weak Jesus who just looks past your sins and pretend it isn't there. I'm talking about the Jesus who willingly went to the cross for you. The one who took it upon himself, the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. As you are lost in your sin, defying a holy God, shaking your fist at him and determining in yourself to do your own thing, he was there being beaten and scourged beyond recognition, all the while telling God, forgive them for they know not what they do. He loved you so much that he stepped into your place. Why? so that he could spend eternity with you, to have a relationship with you. That is the sin that you need. That is the, what Jesus wants for you. But you need to answer that door. I like the picture of uh, Revelation 3.20. The door that he's knocking on doesn't have a knob on his side of the door. It's on your side. You have to open it. God is a gentleman. He will not force it upon you. He wants you, he wants you to receive him today and you can do that today. And so I'm gonna have Mike come up here. You wanna come up here and get plugged in and get ready? Here, I'll turn your little microphone on. As he's, we are starting a new thing here. Um, why is it not coming on? There it goes, it's on now. We're gonna have Mike close in song for us. Um, we, he's been doing our Friday night um, prayer meetings once a month and I've known Mike for a long time he does a good job so he's going to start helping out with a closing song on Sundays as we respond but first let's pray Lord Jesus we just come before you and we thank you so much again for who you are we thank you Lord that you are God and that you're oh so holy and righteous Lord that you're not like me Lord, that you, because of your holiness and your righteousness, was able to come down and live the life that I failed miserably to live. You were the perfect, sinless sacrifice that stepped in my place and took upon yourself the punishment that I deserve for my sins. And now I can stand by grace in your sight. And Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you promised that you would never leave us or forsake us. 
Lord, that you're with us even today, Lord, as we walk through the trials of life, Lord, and the difficulties, and even in our sin, you're there helping us up to get out of it, Lord, to confess those sins, and that you faithfully cleanse us of those things as we confess them and continue to walk in you, Lord. You are a good and awesome God. We just pray this week that we would make sure that we are worshiping you, Lord, correctly and rightly. And God, I just pray, Lord, for anybody who's here or watching online that maybe this is the first time they've been introduced to who you really are. And they're ready now to put their faith and trust in you. And if that's you, you can simply say a prayer like, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Lord, come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. Lord, I pray for anybody, it doesn't matter how they're saying it, whether they can word it, however it is, you know what it is because you've been working on them, Lord that you would come in and make your home in them. And Lord, that they would find the wonderful grace that comes from having a relationship with you. So Lord, just be with us the rest of this week as we take some time now to respond to you through this closing song, Lord, that you would hear us and answer according to your will and your timing. So we thank you and give you glory today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So thank you guys. I'll be out front here if you guys need anything. Um, my, my beautiful wife, Cheryl, made some uh, cupcakes in honor of Judd's birthday. They're out in the foyer. Uh, she was going to make a cake, and then she came up with a clever idea of cupcakes. She said, oh, then we don't have to have plates, forks, or, or all that knife to cut the cake and all that stuff. So, um, Oh, Thanksgiving's coming up next month, and uh, this song is called Give Thanks to the Lord. 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 He is good, and His mercy forever endures good and his mercy forever endures give thanks to the lord give thanks to the lord give thanks to the lord he is good and his mercy forever endures he is good and his mercy forever endures god is the lord He has given us life. He has offered for us a sacrifice. He is my God, and I will praise him. He is my God, and I will exalt him. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. He is good and his mercy forever endures. It's good and his mercy forever endures. God is the Lord. He has given us life. He has offered for us. A sacrifice, for well, he is my God, and I will praise him. He is my God, and I will exalt him. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good and his mercy forever endures. He is good and his mercy forever endures. He is good and his mercy forever endures. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Oh, my pleasure.